What's up guys? So uh, today's video is going to be about some old reading material. I've been doing some uh, some cleaning out again and uh, I have a ton of old um, magazines, uh, mostly knife related, uh, but I do ha obviously have some gun related stuff as well. A lot of Blade Magazine, Knives Illustrated, uh, Tactical Knives, um, Knife Art, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but these are the oldest ones, and I thought this was pretty interesting for a topic. But before I get into here, I just want to show they do have a stack of Arms Gazette starting from October 1973 all the way to 1979 on the bottom there. Um, yeah, February 79 was $1.25. But yeah, just random years, random stuff in here. Super cool for a gun reference, a lot of old revolvers. A lot of uh, technical specs, some cool ads and stuff. But uh, I have no use for these stuff, you know, at least with the gun. I, I save all my knife stuff, and I have some gun magazines, but I'm still keeping. However, no use for this. So if you guys are interested, want to work out a trade or something, uh, let me know on uh, on Instagram, Cutlery Lever Jeff. But anyway, as far as the knife stuff, I want to show these. This is American Blade Magazine. I have March, April, 1977, um, December, 77, June, 79, and October, 1980. And I grabbed these four because I found something pretty cool and fun and interesting uh, in each one of them, which I want to go over real quick here, which is going to kind of give a, a point. And I have a, I have a general point to make about knives at the end of the video. So, I don't really recall exactly what I want to show in each one, so we're just going to flip through a little bit until I can remember, to be honest. So, starting off, this is 1977. Here's an old, old-timer, uh, Schrade advertisement. These old publications are very cool for the ads. Here's a, a case lockback. This is the Shark Tooth. I have the case Mako, which has a very cool story behind it. I got my, my buddy Chris. Uh, I think I've told that story before. Uh, and I'm trading some weed for it. <laughs> I still have that uh, to this day. But anyway, let's see. What did I want to talk about here? Oh, look at that. Frisco sleeve dagger. So you can hide that on your, your forearm. Very uh, 70s, I guess. I would think that would be more 80s stuff. But yeah, interesting. Western uh, cutlery. Flip through. There's a couple of these really old ones. I actually talked about that before. Some of the most expensive collector's knives are like this one. I think I showed this on another video, like world's most expensive knife or something, $250,000 is the estimate for something like that. And that, that is legit, it's real. Uh, finding one is probably impossible. It's probably in a museum somewhere, to be honest. That's why the price is so high. Here's a cool old article on case knives. Again, in the 70s. Making some case cutlery. So, there's case Todd Buster. Have one of those. Stockman, Sportsman Stockman. Fantastic knives. I really can't think of what I want to show in this first one. There's some stuff on some swords. I'm pretty sure it's an ad. It's going to be in here somewhere. Hmm. I set these ones aside because I have more of these too. I set these aside for a specific reason and now I literally can't remember why. Hmm. Oh, okay. This is why. Now I remember. All right, so here's an ad in the back. Um, first of all, it's kind of cool. Join the K-Bar Knife Collectors Club. Mail this card to blah, blah, blah. Uh, K-Bar Knife Collectors Club. Interesting. All right, anyway. So I saw this. This is an advertisement for the Flicket. <laughs> okay, the Flicket is a little device. All right, if you can see here. Let me zoom in a little. It goes, gets attached to your lockback knife and has a little thing sticking up. And the idea is you use your thumb and you can one hand open your little lockback knife. Okay, instead of using the, uh, the nail neck or something. And looking at this, I'm, I'm looking through and I'm like, you know, if that thing was put on backwards, it would literally just be an Emerson Wave. Right? How cool is that? I wonder if anyone ever did that back in the 70s, you know? I thought that was really, really cool. $2.95. Um, cash certified check or money order. Add five cents to avoid coin problems in the mail. Interesting. Um, 
So yeah, that was made in Georgia. CKC Manufacturing. I uh, sold these. It says, um, indispensable for the sportsman, carpenter, electrician, plumber, or tradesman that needs one hand, uh, needs one handed use of his knife. Even gloved hands are no problem. Perfect as a hand guard for cutting, whittling, or scaling. This new invention attaches to most single lockback blade knives to uh, enable quick access to your cutting blade. Faster than a switchblade. That's true. It is faster than a switchblade if it was a wave. I mean, there's a slight curvature down. I'm sure even just how it's supposed to be mounted, you could probably still wave it out of your pocket. Now at this point, I know you're gonna probably point out the fact there's no pocket clip, um, but you could probably wave it out of the pocket if it's just sitting in your pocket and you held it properly. As you're pulling out, you can wave it open. Um, so if you don't know, pocket clips invented by Spyderco. That's right, Sal Glesser, uh, the CEO and owner of Spyderco Knives came up with the pocket clip. So if you like, you know, clipping your knife to your pocket, you should probably um, send them a message and say thanks. Thanks for inventing that. Every single pocket knife in the world has it. Very cool. Well, you know, not everyone, but most of them do. So anyway, the Flick It. Super, super cool. Uh, let's read on here. It says, um, no one that uses a knife should be without one. It's as useful as your thumb itself. Uh, and it's as legal as wearing shoes. Very cool. Um, Let's see, good things uh, come in small packages. The Flick It is made of heat treated, spring steel, and nickel plated for long wear. Flick It 1, Flick It 2, or Flick It 3 fits most single lockback blade knives and is ideal for working on sports activities in the cold. See your dealer or order direct from the address below, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. So uh, the wave function, um, and there's multiple different devices that have been uh, put out over the years. I know of a couple that were in the uh, 80s, especially the mid to late 90s, um, and even now, even recently, you know, you guys can probably, uh, you know, figure out what I'm talking about. But there was a, a bunch of different devices to basically be able to open your lockback knives one-handed, way before they were using thumb studs and, you know, blade holes and different opening mechanisms. So, pretty cool. All right, next up here is December 1977. See, so we got a cool uh, two-bladed K-Bar uh, Hunter slip joint on the front cover. Let's see what we got going on here. I want to say, like even back then, like they're selling these uh, knife sharpeners. It's literally a belt sander. You know, this is what we use today. Is what you know, custom knife makers use all the time. It's a motor that turns some wheels and some pulleys, right? And you have a belt. So even back then, they're doing it the same way. That's how you grind down metal. All right. So why did I put this one aside? Um, I'm assuming it's another ad. Don't really know yet. It's here somewhere. Oh, here we go. That's why. <laughs> so even back in 1977, they had survival knife cards. Okay, so how many people have seen the uh, super popular Chinese made, you know, 15 functions in one, 20 functions in one, whatever it is, uh, that basically is just a credit card sized piece of metal that's stamped out or, you know, this is American made, you know, right here made in the USA, it's called the Life Tool. Um, how many versions of this have you seen in your life, right? Well, they were doing it all the way back in the mid 70s. How about that? Allison Forge Corporation in Belmont, Massachusetts. All right, so let's read this here. Emergencies come without warning. What you have in your person is what you live with. That's why you should have a life tool, no matter how many other fine knives you own. Life tool fits in your wallet, so it's always with you. A precision instrument the size of a credit card made of 440C stainless. Uh, it cuts, chisels, punches, skins, and strips. Points to magnetic north. Um, I'm, looking at, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the tool for a compass. I, I guess there's a compass right here. I would hope it's not just an arrow that's engraved on there and obviously wouldn't always point to north. Anyway, uh, it's mirror polished uh, for signaling. $14.95, postpaid included vinyl case and miniaturized survival manual printing or picturing over 40 uses, excuse me. So yeah, that thing has been around since the mid 70s they've been pitching them, only they were American made back then. Now of course they're made in China, although I have to say there are some practical credit card style knives uh, right off the top of my head, the Snowdy Crisis card. 
Mike Snowdy makes a custom uh, card like that, which you can obviously use in self-defense situation. It's not pitched as a survival thing, but it's very much pitched as it will definitely, uh, you know, get you out of a sticky situation as a last, very last resort. So moving on, let's go this one. We have June 1979. All right. So let's see why I put this one aside. I genuinely don't remember. It was a nice uh, case to add. I don't remember each each one of these has something. That's why I have it aside. So I gotta figure it out. To, oh, I already see it. Right here. So even back then, they had the the birth of the survival knives, where all of your survival kit is inside of your hollow handle. This one is from Quicksilver, uh, or it's called the Quicksilver. It's from Thornton Knives. And let's see, they were in South Carolina. Designed by Danny Thornton to be light and sturdy with a functional sheath, the Quicksilver knife is all this and more. Handcrafted with 440C stainless steel, uh, hardened to RC58, hollow aluminum handle, waterproof cap for storing survival paraphernalia, and so forth. Super cool. And now that I remember this, I know there's another one in here which was worth getting. I don't know anything about the Quicksilver or its quality. However, I saw something very similar in here. A very trusted name on it. Somewhere, somewhere in here. Giant sharpening machine, right? Big old belt sander. Oh, here it is. Right there. Randall Knives. So that one would uh, be worth a pretty penny today. Uh, if you know, you know. Orlando, Florida. Super cool. And last up here, we have the October 1980 issue of American Blade magazine. So let's see, why did I put this one aside? Oh, not why, but who, who knows that benchmark knife? I did a video on it. Very, very cool design. Still in my unique knife mechanism collection. There's some cool blasts in the past here. And there's also a bunch of stuff I've never seen before. We've seen this uh, design, many, many people copied it, where basically you have a, uh, a Foley knife with a blade that's longer than the handle, but this way it's smaller overall in your sheath. This is a cool, this would make a great little neck knife. Well, I, shouldn't, I don't know how little it is, but yeah. interesting, but not why I set this, oh, here it is, this is why. <laughs> so this is great. Here's a, an advertisement from K-Bar, 1980. For the K-Lock, the K-Lock revolutionary new K-Bar. No other lock blade looks like it because no other lock blade locks like it. Winner of the 1980 American Firearms Industry Design Award. So get this technology, here we go. This has the safety pause, all right? Safety pause mechanism built into this baby. Prevents accidental blade closing. You might know it as a half stop. So when you're closing this knife, it literally just stops in the midway point so you can move your hand position around and it doesn't cut you. Pretty cool. So if you ever use a half stop on a slip joint or something, uh, just know that K-Bar, I don't know for sure if this was the first time it was pointed out as a feature, but that's the safe T pause. Safety pause mechanism. Very cool. Unique hidden bolster mechanism unlocks the blade. Now, I don't have this knife. And I really want this knife, not because of the safety pause feature, <laughs> but I really want to see how this actually unlocks. I'm assuming that the back spring pivots and this, this whole bolster probably pushes forward if it was connected in a way, or this was one piece with the, the back spring and you push that, that bolster by pushing it forward, it would probably lift, you know, the lock itself to unlock it. That's a total guess. I've never seen this knife. Um, I'll be on the hunt for it, but <laughs> who knows if I'll ever find this one or what the uh, outrageous price will be if the person uh, knows what it is. But anyway, yeah, the K-Lock. K-Lock is covered by K-Bar's new lifetime warranty. Ask for details. Uh, you can get your hands on a new K-Lock today. Well, uh, 42 years ago. Um, at your nearest K-Bar dealer. So yeah, interesting. Cool stuff. Very cool stuff. So yeah, I just I kind of broke these out just to uh, to look at them a little bit, and I, I thought it was kind of fun 
to see some of this stuff. I mean, like I said, some of the stuff is familiar, some of the stuff was totally new to me, but I thought it was awesome. So what have we learned here today? We've learned a couple things like there's not much new in the knife scene. Sometimes someone will come up with something brand new and uh, sometimes it really is brand new. Um, just off the top of my head, like the shark lock from Demco, that's something that's new. I don't think that existed in the 70s or 80s or 90s, right? But sometimes like people, they'll come up with something and it might've happened already, but it was, it was there and it was uh, forgotten about, no one cared about it, it wasn't popular, and the people who remember it all passed away because they're too old. That just happens sometimes. So a lot of times things are reinvented all the time that did exist, you know? That, um, what was it, the flicker? I gotta remember what it's called. Yeah, I gotta see, see the ad again. I wanna just make something up. Flicker. Come on. Come on. Oh, it's on the back. The flick it. The flick it. I knew flicker wasn't right. The flick it. That thing's been around for a long time. Let's do some math. 1977, three years to 1980, 42 years, 42, it's 45 years. 45 years ago, there was a mechanism that just attached to the back of the blade and uh, essentially was a attachable uh, wave function, you know? So, like I said, I mean, some things are new, some things are old and then just rediscovered, uh, like these, these catalogs. These catalogs are very old and I very much enjoyed them when I got them and now I'm rediscovering them once again. It's very difficult to come up with something new uh, in the knife industry. Extremely, extremely difficult. You can keep reinventing the wheel over and over and you can keep making that wheel look a little bit different. And it seems like it's new and exciting and there's so many people who never saw the original wheel. So it is new and exciting to them. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, this isn't like a complaint or rant at all. I just think it's fascinating. Um, but you know, great people have similar ideas too. Believe it or not, you can have the exact invention as someone else. That's possible, right? We all use logic. We look at the world around us and what we have available to us and we try to better things. That's the whole point of invention. Taking something, taking a task, making it easier, making it more fun, making it more convenient, you know? Uh, we're constantly, as people, as humans, inventing new things to make our lives easier and, uh, and more convenient. Or uh, entertainment, there's a heavy focus on entertainment because we eat, we sleep, we crap, you know, we go to work and we gotta do something in between. You know what I'm saying? We gotta entertain ourselves, keep ourselves happy. But uh, yeah, I thought this was kind of cool. So yeah, if you happen to have uh, old knife magazines or watch magazines or gun magazines, whatever you're into, whatever your hobby is, these are fun things. You could find these on eBay sometimes, not like this specific one, I don't even look. There might be them on there, there might not be. Um, I remember at some point I went on eBay and I bought a bunch of uh, old High Times magazines. Why? Because I used to look at High Times magazines back in the day. I, mean, you know, I used to smoke some weed. Um, and they'd be fun. And I remember all the ads on there for the fake weed and all the pipes and all that kind of fake, uh, fake urine, you know, to pass your drug test, all that stupid stuff. It's just funny. And, uh, I don't have an actual use for those, uh, those magazines, but I still have them. And occasionally I'll break them out and look at them. It's just, it's just fun to me. It's entertaining, I guess. Maybe I'm weird, maybe I'm not. Uh, but it's a little blast from the past. And although this isn't what wasn't my era, this all came out before I was born. I was born in 1984. And there's all kinds of people watching these videos of all ages as well. So you might be watching this and you might have these exact same ones. You might remember getting these, you know, after work or something or when you were a kid. Maybe you got them from your dad or maybe you were interested as a kid. It's just cool. It's cool. And even today, publication, unfortunately, like print, print, it, people say print is dead. It's not dead, but it is definitely suffering. Uh, it's dying a little bit. Not a whole bunch of people out there going to the newsstands, buying magazines anymore. Uh, even myself, like I used to have all these different subscriptions, you know, like I said, Tactical Knives and Knives Illustrated, Blade Magazine. Um, I loved it I, and I, I still do. I just don't spend money on that because I spend so much time online basically reading about the latest and greatest. I don't have to buy a magazine uh, to learn about it, but at some point you did. That's how people got their information through magazines and it costs a little bit extra. Consider yourself very lucky, especially if you're young. A lot of stuff that used to cost money, all of a sudden is free. You used to have to pay an electrician to come to your house. Now you don't necessarily have to. You can just hop on YouTube. You know, whatever your problem is, you could probably watch an electrician tell you how to fix it for free and do it yourself. We live in a pretty darn convenient world. Um, and, you know, if you're young, you might not realize that because you don't know anything different. 
But if you're older, you definitely know uh, a different life that was uh, not quite as convenient. But anyway, that's it for now. Just want to share this. I thought this was pretty interesting. And also, like I said, see if anyone out there is interested in the Arm Gazette issues that I have here. Um, it is neat. I just, uh, I'm trying to make some room and stuff. So hit me up, send me a message if you want those, and maybe we could work something out. That's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I will see you tomorrow with a brand new video. Take care.